So Bhaktivedanta Academy is an institution which was uh, established in uh, 1984, but it was actually established by Shah Prabhupada before that. In our academy, then uh, we are trying to give the proper education to the children and to the adults. We are training them in a way how they can actually become educated or highly educated people. That means that uh, we put a lot of emphasis in training them in their character, their values, and also then in uh, proper uh, studies of other subjects. So for us it's important when they are getting knowledge that the knowledge is supported by their character. That's the traditional Vedic view that the student who doesn't develop proper character will not be having access to the deep knowledge of the Vedic scriptures. So for us it's very important that uh, we teach the students to the depth of the Vedic Shastra based on Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our main scriptures. But for them to properly understand how to apply these in their life, they must have the proper character. This is defined by our Acharya Rupa Goswami as highly learned person. So when the students get the proper learning that way, then they can become leaders, leaders in our society. And not only that, they will be able to train other leaders. So this is the main view of our academy to train the students such a way so then they can properly understand then the view of Shina Bhagavatam and they are able to apply it in their own lives and they are able to spread it throughout the world so that other people can also understand and apply it in their lives. The Bhaktivedanta Academy is a educational institution, obviously. It's what you could call an umbrella institution. Within Bhaktivedanta Academy we have a variety of schools and colleges um, which perform different functions. But the central goal of the academy, the ethos of the academy, is basically to propagate, practice um, and research the Bhagavatam and then the Vedic literatures through the eyes of the Bhagavatam and, and particularly obviously uh, through the eyes of our founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. That's what the academy is. I came to the Bhaktivedanta Academy a bit late. I studied first uh, in university in uh, Europe and came after that so I didn't experience the the young age here in in the academy in Gurukula but when I came then I basically submitted myself as a student so I did have the you know, some time as uh, as a student but very quickly then uh, I was encouraged by the teachers to also start teaching, taking care of ashram activities, taking care of boys. And as I was learning the various subjects, then I was teaching them. So through the time when I was studying, then I had uh, 
very you know, clear view of how, what the different education in such a Gurukula system is compared to the modern style of education, which I went through also. And I could see the advantages of, of the traditional Gurukula education, and I was very much impressed. The, the effort is put into developing the individuality of each student, which I experienced myself. And the same experience I did not have with the traditional education. So then I started to you know, take care of the boys and to bring them up, to give them you know, the same education, to properly develop, you know, help them to develop their character. And the results were you know, very great. So therefore, I decided that uh, this is my place to stay and I didn't have any other need to go anywhere else. So then it only naturally happened that uh, as I was then no, staying here, then I was taking up various uh, say positions. And no, in those, and uh, now I'm acting as a dean, one of the deans of the academy and then you know, in that position then I'm serving my Guru Maharaj, I'm serving Shri Prabhupada and I'm serving the boys. We go through life with different experiences. So I, I was born in, in, the, in ISKCON um, and then I, I went to Gurukul at a very young age. I went to Gurukul in New Govardhan in Australia first um, when I was four years old. So, and then when I was eight years old, I came to Mayapur, to the, to the Gurukul. Um, it was called the Bhaktivedanta um, Gurukul village at that point. In, in 87, I came, 1987. Then in 1994, um, when I was about 15, I went back to Australia. Um, went to Kami school, high school. Uh, and then I did a little studying here and there in college. And then I, I decided to enroll in university. Um, I did. Uh, a Bachelor of Science in majoring in traditional Chinese medicine and that was a four-year degree and then I moved to Mayapur again. Um, I always had the idea that I would return because frankly speaking the Gurukul experience was mixed. Um, there was a lot of positive aspects. I had I, I formed a lot of positive relationships um, in the academy. Uh, it wasn't the academy then in the Gurukul um, from New Govardhan. There was a couple of standout teachers and I formed some lifelong friendships there. Um, and then in, in India, in Mayapur, the environment was a little tougher. Um, there was a lot more kids, a lot less resources. Um, so the experiences were, were varied. Um, some very negative experiences I had and some very positive experiences I had. Particularly, I think, in the formation of a, of a value system based on um, responsibility based on that if I want my life together, I have to do something about it. Um, we can't give the, our responsibility for our lives to anybody. Um, and then one of the main reasons I joined the academy again was to, uh, you know, Gurukul is a, is a mystical thing in ISKCON, in the world. People don't understand what Gurukul is. Some people think it's an extreme kind of religious education. Some people think it's a some kind of a sentimental niche education. But Gurukul is, is really about a fundamental basis of how human beings gain knowledge, retain knowledge and practice that knowledge um, in their lives, they, how they apply it in their lives. So I felt that I, I, I maybe, maybe when I came back to Mayapur to join the academy again, I don't, probably couldn't verbalize that, but I had it in the back of my head, in the back of my mind that Gurukul education, there was something valuable to it. And at that time, it was very unfashionable within the movement. It still is to some degree. So it was an uphill battle. So I joined, um, you know, to try to give my experiences um, for the next generation so that we could keep improving on what is a very, very fundamental and important 
uh, piece of human life, uh, not devotional life, human life. Uh, and we've developed a lot in the last 15 years, you can say. We, we've taken the academy from, uh, you know, six students um, with, 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 a, with a clear mission, but not a clear processes. And we've, you know, we've clarified that with the help of a lot of good, good people, good teachers, good students as well. Um, uh, we've, and so we've, we've, we've come a long way since I was in school, um, for sure. And even in the last 10 or 15 years, we've come a long way in really understanding what that funder is. What is it that makes Gurukul the educational experience for, for humans? Why is it Gurukul? How do we apply it? How do we make it work in today's environment, in today's society, with today's pressures, where people want a quick fix, people want to press a button, take a pill, um, do a quick course, uh, watch a quick video, how do we how do we um, apply the system in this in this day and age? Uh, so that's our continued effort, because uh, because we believe everyone in the academy and I believe very strongly that it is the system of education for humans. There's no there's no other way for a successful education um, to be. Which what does that mean when we talk about education? Am I acquiring some knowledge, some skills? What is it all about? Education, at the root of it, is about change. It's about evolution and evolution of the self. So the rest of it's all extra, it's all bonus. So if we can, if we can get students thinking about that and then starting to try to apply that, then we feel that we've done a good job. Um, so the deans are, the, are responsible for the individual progress and development the holistic development, it's a popular buzzword, holistic, but it's a practical word as well. The emotions, the mind, the intelligence, the spirit. So how the bottom line for the Dean is that the development of the individual. For me personally, I take it um, that I do my best to try to, uh, with, in my limited capacity, to inspire people as much as I can. Everyone's got a potential, um, everyone's got needs and desires and I try my best to to inspire people to fulfill their best, um, you know, not, not. Uh, I don't think I'm a magician or a great leader or anything like that. I just try to help people to be the, the best that they can be. Um, uh, that's my. That's how I personally approach it. The traditional education, which was established by the Lord Himself long long time ago that that education it's always fresh it's always relevant different times of the millennia then there may be slightly different applications of those depending on the predominance of the people depending on you no know, their thoughts or their views, but the, the point is that as much then the traditional education, the methods are applied, then that much, then the results come properly as, as the students graduate from such institutions. Now, we started uh, with the modern education, thinking that uh, it may actually help the students. But as we see, it doesn't give them that much of advantage. We see that the traditional education then was here for, as we said, many years, many thousands of years. And then we see it's still here, people are applying it, and therefore we should uh, definitely give it at least a thought. Why is it like that? Why is it that the traditional education survived for so long? And the answer would be that uh, 
the boys or the, the students trained in such an education, they are able to apply themselves and realize themselves in their lifetime. So it gives them satisfaction. The traditional education very much focuses on developing relationships and then you know, applying these relationships in their lives, which uh, leads them to that they get the maximum amount of pleasures actually from their life. Pleasure does not necessarily mean only sense gratification. That's what we understand that it is because our view is just the, the gross view that gratifying the senses, that's what we can do right now. We get little pleasure out of it. But every sense gratification leads eventually to depression. If you look at it, intoxication. And no, a person can stay high for some time, but then, and after that, there's a depression. Illicit sex. Then now, uh, gives the problems. But yes, no, people have pleasure from the sexual activities for a moment, but then the, the consequences from doing so, diseases, depressions. Then the gambling, same way. How many people actually win in gambling? If you look in the, the casinos, they are built very opulently from the people who play in the casinos. So casinos are not meant for giving people, giving money to the people. And with meat eating, no, we see even now the industry has more and more problems. They want to stop meat eating because they, they naturally for producing meat, then they need a lot of land to feed the animals and becomes more and more problem. Yes. So if you follow the traditional principles that following the regulative principles, then we can get more out of our lives. And to realize that one needs to be properly educated. So this is what the traditional education do. It trains the students the way how they actually take most advantage of their life. And what do we want to do? The ultimate realization is that we want them to connect the, their lives to understand being the servant of Krishna and therefore then you know, properly apply themselves in devotional service. So that's the goal of the traditional education, which is missing in the, the modern education. Therefore, the modern education is incomplete that way. That question is like asking, can education, is, is education relevant? Because there's no such thing really as heritage education or traditional education. All there is, is education. Now, um, what we mean by that is, how effective am I in educating people, educating myself and others? That defines the value of that education. Now, we use the word heritage to indicate that our educational system has some, has some um, authority that it has a tradition going back thousands and thousands of years. So that's why we use that word. But in actuality, my personal feeling is that there's no such thing. Education means education. Now, I can do it effectively or ineffectively. I can do it considering the person as a whole or as a part. And so what we try to do is we really try to look at that person as a whole, as a unit. How do I take this person from A to B to C to Z? Right? And, and I have to consider a lot of factors in doing that. And 
I have to consider that education is an evolutionary process. I'm not trying to give someone a set of skills, um, a set of techniques. I'm trying to, uh, you know, awaken something in that individual person, just like I'm trying to awaken something in myself. So um, it's more relevant today than it's ever been. It's more important today than it's ever been. Why? Because there's very little education in this world. Even the elite schools, they still focus on one aspect of perhaps character. They, a strong citizen they would like to develop, or someone who can stand up and look after his family, or, or the nation, or the, you know, etc. So, um, it couldn't be more important. It couldn't be more relevant. Because today's society is fragmented, the people are suffering, the people are unhappy, the people are looking for an alternative, how they can bring meaning into their life. So in the traditional Vedic education, the, the focus is on training the student in such a way so then uh, he gave, gets the education in the subject with the proper understanding of the values, the character, and he is led to contemplate or actually deliberate on that subject to such a way so then he can apply it and realize it. In the Upanishads, it is called Shravanam, Mananam, and Nididhyasanam. Shravanam means that the student, he acquires the knowledge from the books, from the teacher, from the peers, and as he acquires the knowledge, then he is contemplating contemplating on how he is going to be using that knowledge in his life. In fact, he deliberates and he is trying to also see the ways of application. And as he then contemplates, then he figures out one way it is better to apply it and this no other way it's not so good to apply it. So then whatever he sees that it's applicable then he goes for, applies it practically, and he gets a realization. Through that realization, then he figures out that was the right thing to do. And he goes back to contemplation. What can I improve? How can I go? Therefore, he also needs to go back to the teacher and inquire inquire from the teacher pranipata pariprasna and from the teacher then what should i do how can i do it how can i do it better i tried i realized how can i do it better as opposed the traditional vedic education then the you no know, modern contemporary you no know, western education it's uh, putting a lot of emphasis on knowledge. It gives a, lot, gives a lot of knowledge to the students, and but it doesn't lead them to contemplate and therefore how to practically apply it and realize it. I myself you know, have realized that when I was studying and at some point I was looking for what am I going, what job I'm going to be doing. So I went to inquire for a you know, few places. And you know, in, in the place, they told me, don't worry, when you finish your study, you come to us. Then, when you come, then first forget everything what you have learned and we will teach you what you need to know. So that was also a moment in my life to realize, why am I studying? Why is it for? If, if it's not useful no, in the place where I'm going to be applying it, then is there no way no, how to actually properly teach or learn such a way so then it is useful? And only when, when I studied the principles of the Vedic education, 
then I realized that what's missing is the the, the principle of of uh, contemplation and realization. So, if the contemporary education would focus more on the character development of the student and they would focus on make the student contemplate on the subject, on the knowledge he is learning and thus lead him to realization, then it will be much more you know, complete education. We have got you no know, many supporters who are encouraging us in you know, training the students the way you know, we are doing based on the scriptures, based on Bhagavatam, based on the instruction of Shah Prabhupada. And there are also you know, people who see that as not the best who do discourage. So now we have to no deal we explain and in fact many of those people who were discouraging in the beginning when uh, they understood in depth what we are doing then uh, they were very clear about that we only follow the instructions of our guru of the Lord through his through the parampara and that actually it is the best way on how to educate the children those who claim that it is not the best way it's just because they are misinformed or uninformed anybody you know who comes and actually sees that uh, what we do how we do then uh, they understand that these are the principles which give the best values to the children and prepare them the best then for their life. So the people sometimes they disagree with many things. Sometimes people they get uh, attached to one idea and seeing some other way of doing things they disagree because of their attachment because of i have learned like this so this is my way and this is only thing which works and now when they get too attached to that idea then they lose the ability to open their mind and to perceive that there may be some other things which are better than what i know and that's actually what the vedic you no know, traditional education does it opens the I you know, opens the mind, opens the heart you know, of the student, and teaches him to see things as they really are. So we see that specifically on the parents of the boys. Some, you now in the beginning they may a little hesitate. They don't know what it is. I don't know anything about it. I was not taught like that. But when they see how the boys are being trained. So they are being trained together with the boys and then more and more they understand that they spread among their friends and their friends become more aware of what's happening here and becoming more appreciative. So overall we see that uh, the trend of applying, accepting the traditional Vedic education in our society is growing. And it's growing, you know, I would say, faster and faster pace right now. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I take it back to responsibility. What I said about what I learned, you know, through my uh, trauma, you could put it. Look, at the end of the day, we in the academy, we have to have a clear vision of who we are and what we are and what we want to achieve. And we have that very, very clear. Everything we do is about doing that better and better. So the way we try to approach the challenges or the baggage from the past, you can say, and, and let's be realistic, it is there and it does exist, is we just have to work on the present. 
we take the lessons we learn, the experiences that we had as an institution, as individuals, and with our goal in sight, with our vision in sight, we move towards that. We can't spend the time worrying about what people think or, or what people know or don't know. We're, we're in the field, as they say, we're, we're in the, on the front, and we just have to keep working. Um, now, unless we have a clear vision, we can't do that. So how do we remain true to the, to the, um, the principles, as you said, without watering things down to try to improve? We just, have a, we just focus on that vision. We focus on the mission, um, which we have crystal clear. And then everything else just fits into place. And we have to be honest also. We have to look at ourselves critically, which sometimes is not easy. Um, as, as individuals, we, we know that. And as an institution, we know that. But we have to critically look at what we're doing. And are we staying true to that mission? And are we doing our best? We can't do any more than our best. But sometimes our best is just an excuse also. Yeah, I'm trying my best, people say. Are you? Are we? So that's the critical thinking. The first answer is going to be, yeah, we're doing our best. But it's the responsibility of the leaders of the academy, of the teachers, of everybody, because we're doing this together, to look critically. Are we actually doing our best? Is the vision in sight? Is the mission in sight? And ultimately, what are we doing this for? We're doing this for the development of the individual, for the children. Are the children happy? Are they developing? Are they actually doing what we talk about? And if they are, it's a major parameter for us. And, and um, so, yeah, I would say that's the way we do it. Everyone is an individual. So we have our, our ideal picture, what it looks like, which is pretty simple. It's an upstanding member of society in general, not just the ISKCON society. It's a person who can stand upright, look the world in the face and move forward how he chooses. Living a life of integrity, living a life based on some values, based on some um, a higher motivation. The material world, this world is a place of suffering, right? How we navigate that suffering determines the quality of our life or not. It's not that we won't suffer or we won't have hardships and trauma, but how we navigate that determines our life and it determines our future success. So our ideal picture of a graduate is someone who can navigate his life with a straight back, as they say, looking it in the eye. Then beyond that, how he treats his family, how he treats his community, how he treats society, is it with respect or pride? Is it in service or is it in taking? They're all, you know, you can say it's secondary aspects, although they are primary aspects, but secondary to moving forward. So we hope that our graduates are in service. They're in the mood to help people. The way how the academy can solve the problems in the modern world is to train the boys properly to become the leaders, but not the political leaders as, as we know them now, but actually leaders who understand the proper principles how the material world works. If they understand that and if they understand the, the ways how to apply it, propagate devotional service, propagate the proper application of the knowledge leading to, to realization, then that will be the best way how they can change not only themselves, but actually the whole world. Real education, as I was saying, it, it, it based, it's based on the individual. So every person who's in the academy has a program tailored for him, him. Education has to be individual. It can't be um, cut and paste for everybody. 
And so one of the failings in the modern educational system is that it's cut and paste for everybody. So we're trying to develop a system where the individual is taken care of, his needs are taken care of, his evolutionary process is taken care of. Now the outcome is up to the individual also. We can only do our best to help that person. You know, there's that age old saying, you can take a horse to the water but you can't force them to drink. So we try to give the individual the tools and the knowledge and skills, um, uh, character required for him to make those, uh, for the individual to make those um, evolutionary steps. But at the end of the day, it is up to the individual. Uh, so we have to take responsibility for our own lives. It's something that's um, very rare in this world. We like to worry about our rights. Um, you know, you have your rights and your responsibilities. Everyone's worried about their rights. What can I get? What's for me? Instead of worrying about their responsibilities. In a healthy society, everybody, if they focus on their responsibilities, as a family, in a family, as an individual, as a, a part of the community, part of society, part of a country, part whatever, then everybody gets taken care of. Because my right, my responsibilities take care of your rights. And your responsibilities take care of my rights. From the basics of how we deal on the human platform, the respect I show you even if I don't know you, my manners, how I see you, to higher principles of doing my duty um, in whatever field of work I'm in, maintaining and looking after my family, loyalty. So um, it's one of the diseases of today. And it's probably not today, it's probably been going on for thousands of years. It's just more acute today, I would say, because everything is obvious. You have no, there's no, you know, all, I'll clarify, everything's obvious, but everything's hidden. Everything looks like it's open and transparent. And you can contact anyone in the world just with the press of a button. But we haven't been more distant from each other in the history of mankind. So we hope that members of the Academy can help each other, help the community and help the world to reconnect on a little bit of a higher principle, a principle based on service, based on love, based on understanding of a supreme, of Krishna, of Sh uh, and service to Srila Prabhupada. That's our, that's our, you know, our fundamental kind of um, driving force as an individual, or at least it's my fundamental driving force as an individual to try to work within that, uh, within that sphere.